And this is what Freedom Road is dedicated to, to, you know, to accomplishing is, you know, is building the struggles of the working of working people, you know, the black liberation, the Chicano liberation movement, other social movements. And through that, bringing about a united front that that can ach accomplish both these short term objectives and also, you know, a long term, you know, we have a long term vision of a socialist country. <laughs> Welcome to Fight Back Radio, a production of FightBackNews.org, taking you to the heart of the people's struggle. I'm your host, Richard Berg, and today our guest is uh, Joe Osbaker, who is uh, the labor uh, co-chair of the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. And Joe has been uh, you know, active in the labor movement for a long time. He's an old friend of mine. I've known him for many years, and that'll probably come across in the interview. But uh, he talks about serious matters today, and I, I think you'll enjoy this. He talks about uh, you know, Ty Reed Nichols' uh, uh, murder that just happened, and it was a sobering thing for all of us. Uh, many of you saw it on a video, and um, it's it's actually even changed, and Joe talks about some of the, the politics of the elections coming up here in Chicago right now because of... Uh, um, you know, people, the right wing was starting to say, oh, we need more police. We need more of this and that and law and order stuff and, and taken away from uh, the power of the people. And this, uh, this brutal act uh, reminded people of George Floyd and Laquan McDonald here in Chicago and, you know, so many others across the country. So I, I think you'll enjoy the show and, um, uh, you know, whatever, give us uh, five stars, give us a good review. You should subscribe to it if you... Uh, if you can. And uh, um, so here it is, uh, Joe Osbaker. So uh, our guest today on Fight Back Radio is uh, Joe Osbaker. Uh, great to have you here, Joe. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, you and I are, I'm six months older than you. So we've we've been involved uh, together for the exact same number of years. <laughs> fair point, fair point. So we, we can, we, we have much to talk about, but I want to start with uh, something current and something very serious. Uh, uh, is uh, the murder of uh, Tyree Nichols. Mm. And uh, this happened, uh, and I know you've been involved uh, with uh, the movement here in Chicago for community control of the police. And can you talk about uh, what happened in Memphis uh, to Tyree and how that's affected uh, the movement here and, you know, around the country? Sure. I mean, the whole the, the whole country, the whole world knows a, a, a Tyree Nichols' name now um, on, on Monday night the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression got together with some other organizations and held a, a, a protest uh, and a march with about 300 people. It was bitterly cold, but people were so motivated to get out despite the fact that it was basically, it was zero outside because of this heinous murder. It's once again, the, you know, the, the country, the world is transfixed uh, you know, looking at the horror of cops beating a young black man to death. It's, well, I was going to say everyone is traumatized, but I'm traumatized. Every person of good conscience is traumatized, but I don't think the politicians are traumatized. They're trying to figure out how do they respond to it. So um, I, I know, well, how, how, how did you respond to it? And not just you, because I know you act in a collective way. You're um, the uh, labor chair for the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. You talked about the march, um, but uh, how are how, you know how are uh, people in the alliance uh, here in Chicago and nationally? How how are you guys reacting to it? Well, the 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 uh, you know the the starting point is first of all to remember that it's it's these videos of these horrendous murders and beatings that have. Uh, been the sparks that have reignited the the Black Liberation Movement, starting with uh, f the Ferguson Rebellion in the summer of 2014, with the uh, you know here in Chicago with the murder of Laquan McDonald, and also in 2014, and then with the the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020, that you know have has uh, you know returned the Black Liberation Movement to the streets uh, as, as it was in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Um, but, you know, just bringing the, you know, politically things up to date, after the George Floyd Rebellion, there was all kinds of promise, 
promises from the politicians about reforms, police reform. And you can look across the country, you can look at Washington, every major city, there was politicians promising reform. And, and in, in almost every location, there was no political change. The only place in the country where there was a substantial victory for the movement against police crimes was here in Chicago with the passage of the legislation uh, empowering communities for public safety, which happened in July 21st, 2021. Um, since the George Floyd rebellion, there's been this, there's also been this law and order, this white racist backlash. And, 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 uh, and you've seen that on display, uh, uh, you know, coming out of the mouths of every politician in the country of both political parties. In, in particular here in Chicago, in the mayoral uh, debates that have been going on over the last month, <clears throat> the, the first debate that I watched, uh, you know, just under two weeks ago, um, with the exception of Brandon Johnson and to an ex extent, Jamal Green and R Rod Sawyer, every other candidate was talking about, you know, the number one issue in the city. And this is true everyone knows this, is public safety. Um, but all the other candidates, all they could talk about was the police as the answer to public safety. And with this video, this m heinous murder by cops, once again, the country is having to address justice the, and, and, the, and the scourge of uh, racist policing that that has dominated um, our cities for more than a century uh, and and so so yeah that's what that's what we've been talking about and and that's why we took action on Monday night uh, in the Chicago Alliance so so why did why does this happen like this I mean it's a uh... Um, you know, actually, well, let me give a plug first uh, for Fight Back Radio. We had Brandon Johnson actually on this show, and uh, so he, he may be the next mayor of Chicago. We'll find out at the end of this month. Uh, but, uh, um, but you know, you, you said, you know, I, everybody, I remember George Floyd. I remember the rebellion. I think all of the Fight Back Radio uh, listeners and uh, on YouTube, those who are watching us, um, and, uh, you know, there, it was it was it was a rebellion across the country. And things, you know, uh, what, you know, what you're saying is, is it just it, it evaporated at a certain point? Uh, you mentioned Chicago as a ray of hope with the um, the empowering communities for public safety ordinance. Um, why, 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 why Chicago? Why did that happen? You know, why was there some success, a slimmer of hope, the way you put it? I think here, um, can you speak to some of those things? It's more than a glimmer of hope. What Chicago did was to. Um, the, the movement uh, for police accountability got the city council and the mayor to pass an ordinance uh, empowering communities for public safety, which is abbreviated as ECPS. Um, and as a result of that legislation, two things have happened. One is there is now a community commission on public safety and accountability, um, which has real power over the Chicago Police Department. It has a decisive voice on policy. So, you know, I not I know not all your listeners are in Chicago, but over the last several months, the CPD tried to <clears throat> renew this program uh, called a gang database program. There's uh, over 100,000 people, almost all black and Latino, who are on this gang database. It's extremely inaccurate. The, the methodology for putting to it together is absurd. Literally, a cop can be sitting in a car, see a known gangbanger standing in a parking lot, and, and then the person that he's talking to, the cop finds out the name of that person. That person's name goes in the gang database. The, the, uh, the city uh, inspector general struck it down, and CPD came back three years later and said, Oh no, we want to keep using it. Well, this commission made a decision and told the Chicago Police Department superintendent, you cannot 
use that gang database. Well, let me ask you about that then. So there's <coughs> the, uh, the the gang database that's gotten some press here, but wh- why is that uh, why is that a bad thing? They have somebody's name in a computer somewhere. Um, is you know, and uh, and why is it significant that uh, the commission now struck it down? Well, the the president of the commission spoke directly to this from his own family's experience. Anthony Driver, who's my union brother also, he's an SEIU uh, activist, Service Employees International Union. Um, He's now the president of this commission. And in the meeting that was held Thursday night, uh, he said that his father has been in this gang database for years even though his father was never a member of any gang. His father um, is, in, is in security, you know, for a living, and he's denied a conceal carry and carry permit because his name shows up in this, this, this absurd list of 120,000, 140,000 black and brown people. Um, so so he, his, his career has suffered. Uh, because of this, that's just a, that's just one example. So, talk a little bit more about this commission. So, the the, the ECPS, um, you know, this uh, our glimmer of hope, or more than a glimmer of hope, as as, as Joe says here, um, in Chicago, uh, came about, um, you know, because of the struggle, uh, you know, before, but then it probably especially after the the George Floyd rebellion. Um, what what why is this significant? Uh, why you know you mentioned the gang database. Uh, what else? What other kinds of things can this commission do, or is it doing that uh, are significant in terms of uh, community control of the police or having some control of the police? Right. It's not yet the the goal of community control of the police, but it's a it's an historic advance in the democratic rights of the you know the black and Latino communities that have lived under police tyranny, you know literally a police state. Uh, in most black and Latino neighborhoods for over a century. Um, so this commission, uh, right now we have an interim commission, but there's also an election coming up and I need to get to that. But this commission, for example, um, gets to uh, a point, hire, that is, and fire the head of the city's body, uh, which is called COPA, which is, um, which is the body that investigates uh, police wrongdoing, and we have seen when that when that body has a, a you know a, a a president of that committee that's that has the the will to hold the police accountable. We've seen excellent outcomes in that body. When the person heading up that committee um, does not want to hold the police accountable, we've seen heinous crimes committed and cops that walk away with no consequences. So th- this commission is going to make certain that that, that, that investigative body has uh, someone dedicated to holding the police accountable. The other thing that's in this legislation is for the first time in the country, February 28th, Chicago is going to have elections. Three uh, councilors will be elected from each uh, of the police districts to to be the the boots on the ground, the local officials who will be, you know, the eyes and ears of that commission to hold the police accountable. They'll be able to call monthly meetings that the commander in each police district will have to uh, attend. They'll be able to get reports um, and they'll be able to take grievances from uh, members of the community and, you know, put it in the face of uh, uh, of these uh, these commanders, um, so and 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 it's just going to be a a grassroots you know it's going to be an, an organized grassroots body. The last thing is that currently we have an interim commission that was created by the city council and the mayor, but this these council members get to then uh, going forward uh, put forward a list of of people who will then make up a full commission. And so it'll be even more tied to these grassroots activists. This commission will be a, a, a living body linked to the movement in the, in the black and Latino neighborhoods, also in the majority white neighborhoods. But you know, the struggle against police crimes has mainly gone on in those neighborhoods that are terrorized by the police department. 
So, and then uh, your organization, the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, has been very active in uh, training uh, people from the, uh, the you know, poorer working class neighborhoods, especially black and Latino, uh, to uh, of how to run for office and what their rights are under this. And, um, you know, the result, I, I, maybe if you could talk about a little bit what the result is, who, who's come forward to run and uh, what kinds of things are you seeing? And, and what do you think this uh, uh, these elected uh, uh, district council uh, uh, um, people are, are going to what's going to look like, do you think, after the February 28th election? It's a uh, it's it's very exciting. There's uh, the majority of the can there's over 100 people running for these 66 seats. Uh, the, 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 the majority of people that are running are black or Latino. Um, uh, and the, and and the majority of them also are people who who come out of an experience of e- either having been you know victims or survivors of the Chicago police um, or or having been part of the movement that wants to hold the police accountable um, and the fraternal order of the police has candidates <clears throat> that they are backing as well but uh, I know you're a trade unionist so I'll use an old uh, an old IWW reference, we are many, they are few. These council members are going to be a majority people who want to hold the police accountable. Um, and so the, you know, the, 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 the next stage of the struggle against um, CPD terror um, is going to be at a much higher level. Okay. So, um, well, let me ask you then also, so, uh, you know, you mentioned Chicago is unique in, in, in this. Uh, and, you know, here we are, you know, people uh, across the country listening to Fight Back Radio. You know, maybe we're part of a protest uh, of, after George Floyd. And uh, now they see this with uh, Tyree Nichols and they're thinking, you know, why can't we, you know, here in Denver or, or wherever, New Orleans, wherever I am, why can't uh, I have, uh, why can't we have that what Chicago has here? What, what, what advice would you give them? How do... How do you go out and start uh, organizing for this kind of thing? What did, what did you do here in Chicago? I want to go through a list of, the, I think, the conditions that made it possible for Chicago to be the first city in the country to have um, a, a, an, a, you know, an election for police accountability, c- civilians to hold the police accountable. Um, so first, to begin with, um, Chicago was among the worst, in some ways, the worst city in terms of the police terror over the black uh, community first and foremost, but the Latino community as well. Um, Many of your listeners and viewers probably know, you know, that Chicago is where um, the, you know, the the Black Panther leader, Fred Hampton, was assassinated in his bed in a conspiracy by the mayor, old man, Mayor Daley. This is 1969 I'm talking about. Uh, The mayor, the, the police department, the, the state's attorney, which is the district attorney here in Cook County, uh, and the, the FBI conspired uh, on that assassination. Chicago is also where uh, a, a, a ring of torturers, white racist cops on the South Side from the 1970s until the 1990s tortured mostly young black men into confessing to crimes they didn't commit. As a result of this torture ring, John Burge was the name of that the, the cop that headed up that torture ring where they u- used electric shock on the genitals of these young men to get them to confess. As a result of this torture ring that went on for 30 years, sh- state of Illinois is the only state that has a torture commission set up by the state government. Chicago has twice had to pass resolutions uh, a- apologizing to the survivors of police torture. And in 2015, Chicago had to pay reparations uh, of over $5 million to about a hundred of the uh, survivors of that torture. So Chicago was the worst city in the country. Um, so, you know, that's one of the conditions that, you know, out of which this movement grew. The second thing is that you know, like everywhere around the country, after the um, after the uprising in Ferguson, when the Black Liberation Movement, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, returned to the streets as a mass protest movement, um, you know that 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 created a mass movement out of which, uh, you know, resistance 
and organizing could develop. Um, third, uh, there had to be a plan and the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression had the strategy. The strategy, community control of the police, first articulated by Bobby Seale and the Black Panther Party, um, was taken up by the National Alliance, which you know was created in 75 and, or 73 and kept going for many years. Frank Chapman, who was the leader of the National Alliance back in the 80s, uh, came back to Chicago in 2010, revived the local chapter and initiated a campaign for community control of the police. Um, and so was able to, you know, intervene, uh, as, as, uh, as Frank likes to say, be headlights, not taillights and provide direction to the movement locally. So, so that's a key moment, am I right? I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but, uh, where, where Frank comes back to Chicago in, in a modern, um, movement, uh, you know, tied to the old, but but still, uh, that leads uh, leads you to uh, where you are now. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, but it seems like that's a critical moment. It is, and the other thing that Frank <clears throat> brought to this this new Black Liberation movement was a principle uh, that uh, that I know you believe in, and I believe in um, that uh, um, that in order to make fundamental progress in this country, there has to be an alliance, a strategic alliance between the, the working class and our organizations, um, mainly the trade unions and the black liberation movement, which is mostly a working class movement. But these two movements, whenever whenever there's been real change in the United States, it's, it, it has almost always happened when these two movements come together. And Frank believed that. And when, we, when, when I met him in 2014, you know, I was a trade unionist. My, my, you know, my and my union, uh, SEIU Local 73. We were the first union in the city to pass a resolution in support of the legislation that the alliance had then, which was called CPAC, Civilian Police Accountability Council. But, but, uh, but from that moment, you know that the you know that that the Ferguson Rebellion happened. Um, and, and, and the Chicago Alliance introduced this strategic concept of community control of the police, we began work to bring uh, a section of organized labor. So after Local 73, we were able to get our, our, uh, our, our you know, comrades and family and uh, United Electrical Workers, and then the Chicago Teachers Union, and then SEIU Healthcare Illinois, Indiana, and eventually over 15 unions uh, in the city of Chicago came in behind this legislation. Um, there's, there's one other element that I want to talk about, which well, is, let me go back to labor for just a quick second then, cause, okay. uh, I, I'm a union guy, you know, this, um, so you, what you're saying, I mean, and you're the, um, uh, the co-chair of the, the labor committee. So it's one is it's, it's striking that, uh, uh, the Alliance has a labor committee and, and holds it in such high regard, but what you, you seem to be going even further and saying, that without uh, organized labor and the black community working together, this uh, ECPS that you've been talking about, this uh, this victory in Chicago, doesn't happen. That's absolutely true. Um, that, and and I'll and I'll uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll tell that story, and then I'll tell you a a a, a, a corollary story. Um, so uh, so SEIU and CTU, SEIU Local seventy three and CTU got behind this legislation and began to support it in 2015. And um, a few years later, uh, a group of, of uh, or a year later, a, a very progressive member of the city council was elected, um, uh, Carlos Ramirez Rosa, um, and he got elected in 2015, rather. And then in 2016, he introduced our legislation into the city council. And so we began, a, you know, to be part of a, a parliamentarian struggle or, you know, an ele a struggle that involved the electoral system, you know, began. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then with the support of these labor unions, um, and with our, our friends in, uh, you know, the, the socialist caucus and with the United Working Families, um, in 2019, we were able to get uh, of the 212 people that that put their hats in the ring to run for uh, alderman in this in February of 2019, 212 people, uh, you know, put themselves forward as candidates. 82 of them 
no, endorsed our legislation, CPAC. Um, but, uh, and then of course, after the George Floyd rebellion, um, then, you know, many more forces, many more unions came to support our legislation. And then it was one union in particular, SCIU, HCII, that saw the possibility for our legislation. And one of their political staff, Anthony Driver, um, was given the task of campaigning to get support in the city council for our, we had to modify our legislation. It became ECPS, but it was HCII and the labor coalition around them that pushed it through the city council. So um, uh, commercial here, uh, our, our listeners of Fight Back Radio will recognize uh, both Frank Chapman and Greg Kelly's names because uh, they've been guests on uh, Fight Back Radio before. And uh, so in, if you are new to Fight Back Radio, I encourage you to go back and uh, look at those past episodes. Uh, you know, Frank uh, talks about his book that he wrote and uh, Greg uh, uh, talks about the issue of health care, which he's the president of a large 90,000 member health care local, but also he deals with this issue of police accountability. Right. So, um, uh, but yes, go on. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a corollary point finally, uh, which is, um, you know, I'm just going to tell you the truth that um, Local 73, CTU um, are, are both progressive unions with, you know, with a leadership that cares about social justice. But it took rank and file members of both locals to um, get other workers, other members organized to support this legislation um, and, and bring it to membership meetings and get the membership of the unions uh, around this. And the members of both unions that did that work are part of Freedom Road Socialist Organization, um, and uh, and I I just cannot overemphasize that you know that that people I know there's a, a lot of people a lot of young people today have become you know won over to the idea of socialism. Many people are you know are are looking to join socialist organizations, but uh, but they, there's a there's one more step that that those young people. Uh, need to understand, which is that the power in the workers' movement is not in the hands of the staff and the officers. It's in the hands of the rank and file. It's it's the workers themselves who are are those unions. And uh, and so I'm um, you know I'm uh, my message to all of the all of the young comrades that are trying to figure out you know you know the old. Uh, Greek, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, there was a Greek physicist thousands of years ago, Archimedes, he said, give me a lever and a place to stand and I could move the earth. And my message to uh, all of your listeners, especially those that are trying to figure out where to stand, you know, uh, join a union as a member and get involved in moving the membership, both into class struggle, but also into, you know, uh, aligning the labor movement with the Black Liberation Movement. So, what are uh, so you're you're involved in these elections now? You're going to elect. It sounds like a lot of uh, you know working class, uh, you know, black and brown people in Chicago who uh, um, ha have a, a, are motivated to hold the police accountable. You'll put forward a new a council which can make policies and make some real changes with the police. Um, what's the next step for the Chicago Alliance? What, 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 where do you guys go from here? What in, uh, after you, uh, uh, have the elections, uh, in February, what, what is, uh, March, April, and May look like for you guys? Well, the, um, these councils are going to have to meet, uh, and in, in each of the 22 councils, there'll be three counselors. They're going to have to make decisions. There's three roles. There's a chair of the of the local council there's the person in charge of of uh, of community affairs which is basically calling meetings to discuss the local police uh department and then there's a a third person who will be you know these all have to be democratically decided who will be on the citywide uh committee of council members to in turn um interview and nominate a total of 14 people 
it'll be the which will be the pool from which a full commission for public safety and accountability will be drawn. Um, the city council and the mayor get to make those, you know, those choices. But the uh, but the councilors give them the names that they must choose from. So you know, it's it's this. As I said earlier, the uh, the council members will be the eyes and the ears for the commission, which is really where the where the power is um, is concentrated over the police. So then, let me let me go back to where you were just a minute ago. Then you you mentioned uh, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization and the role it played in um, in in making all this happen. Um, why is that important? Why can't uh, you know you know places just uh, uh, you know have a uh, um, you know you know, politicians have uh, insight and, uh, um, you know, have progressive politicians say, okay, well, we're going to do the right thing automatically. We're going to let the people decide. We're going to have democracy, et cetera. Why do you see it that it has to take this 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 road? Well, um, all right. You know, there's there are two political parties uh, in this country. There's the Democrats and the Republicans. And I think most of your uh, you know, listeners and viewers, uh, I'm confident they understand how terrible the Republican Party is for working people. But um, they also have to remember that both of those political parties represent the same class of billionaires. Um, it's just that one of those parties, the Republicans, wants to rule with, the, you know, the, the iron fist uh, and the Democrats want to rule with a velvet glove over that iron fist. And, uh, and you know, you can see this in so many ways, but I've lived in Chicago for the last, you know, 30, uh, 37 years, and I've seen what Democratic administrations have done. Let's take, for example, Rahm Emanuel, who, you know, was, uh, Ra you know, Barack Obama's uh, chief of staff. In, uh, in the White House when Obama first got elected. When Emmanuel becomes mayor of Chicago, he goes to <clears throat> war against the Chicago Teachers Union. And when uh, Laquan McDonald is brutally gunned down, shot 14 times by a sociopath cop, uh, uh, Jason Van Dyke, Rahm Emanuel covers up the video in order to get himself reelected a few months later. This is the Democratic Party. Now, there are reformers within the Democratic Party, but they're not in control of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party uh, exists to maintain the system. If there's going to be a challenge, an effective challenge to the system, it has to come from outside of the Democratic Party. And really, it has to come from the working class and you know the you know the working class is mainly organized through the you know the trade unions and secondarily through mass movements especially in the national liberation struggles the black liberation chicano liberation struggles um and uh and you know and the, so the, that's where these ideas that's where these initiatives have to come from and this is what freedom road is dedicated to to you know to accomplishing is you know is building the struggles of the working of working people, you know, the Black Liberation, the Chicano Liberation movement, other social movements, and through that, bringing about a united front that that can ac accomplish both these short term objectives and also, you know, a long term. You know, we have a long term vision of a socialist country. So, so yeah, that's uh, that's that's my opinion. So, um, I mean, you've you've you've. Uh... You've, you've mentioned here, Joe, and, and with uh, you know convincing and, and with passion, um, you know your uh, your vision and your views of how to fight for justice and and what you know uh, people have accomplished, um, you know here in Chicago and what they can accomplish in other cities for community control of the police and unions and such. Um, you know, I, I want to. I've known you a long time. I've known you for decades and decades, and so uh, I want to pivot back to. Uh, uh, you know, the young Joe Osbaker I knew in Iowa and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, who was a student at the University of Iowa. And, you know, how, how did you get involved in all this? How, how did, you know, 
the guy uh, you know who had worked on a farm and done other odd jobs uh, suddenly you know end up uh, uh, you know here in Chicago and fighting for community control of police and you know we haven't talked about it but you were on the executive board of uh, SEIU seventy three and were a labor leader for decades uh, here in Chicago as well. How did you? How did you get involved in that, you know, in, in the first place? What's uh, what's the starting point here? Sure. So um, so it's true. I was born and raised in Iowa. I, 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 I wasn't born on a farm. I was born in a hospital. We have hospitals in Iowa, but I I grew up on a farm. Um, and then I, I and I was a pretty right wing kid, uh, actually. But I, I, I went to the University of Iowa and I was open minded enough that when I when I met um, students, especially students from other countries and other cultures, I I listened to what and I believed what they were saying. So so the first thing that politicized me really was the Vietnam War. I was this was you know two years after the end of the Vietnam War, but but you know the aftermath of that war was still uh, you know was still tearing the country apart. Um, and then I became a student activist around a number of causes, but the, the real turning point in, and how I came to Chicago was, you know, so Reagan got elected in, in 1980, which was, I, I couldn't believe that the country was moving backward after I thought it was moving forward for, you know, a, a few years. Uh, and then in 1983, I was watching WGN TV, which, you know, even back then before the internet, you could get that in Iowa. Um, and I watched as Harold Washington won the election for mayor in Chicago, defeating the old white racist Democratic Party. And even though that's not its official name, that's how I've always thought of it ever since, white racist Democratic Party. And, and when I saw that, I said, I'm going to Chicago. I wanna be part of, of that movement. I have always believed, as I said earlier, you know, since I became politicized, that the, you know, that the working class and the national liberation movements, especially the black liberation movement, are the two forces in this country that have the potential to transform politics and society. And so I saw that coming together under Harold Washington's leadership. So it took me a few years to get it together. I moved to Chicago in 86. I was part of Harold's re-election campaign, and tragically, he died of a heart attack six months into his second term. The movement fell apart. So, you know, you know what was a, a white working class kid? Because by this point, my parents had lost the farm, so I was working class. I was no longer middle class. What was I supposed to do, you know, to contribute? So I, I well, and then, um, Anyway, I had to get a job, so I got a job at, at a at a unionized um, hospital at at University of Illinois at Chicago, um, and got involved in the union and built helped build it up over the next thirty two years. I just retired last year, but uh, but it, it was it from that position when when I met uh, Frank Chapman uh, in the summer of uh, twenty fourteen um, that I began to think about. You know that this is something that that my union ought to get involved in so so yeah well why don't you talk about that a little bit so i mean you mentioned earlier uh seiu local 73 your union uh was very involved in this and uh, uh and maybe even go before the community control of the police issues as you were involved uh working at the university of illinois chicago there was there was fights for uh equal pay with springfield i remember there was a strike at the um, uh, recently during the COVID times at the UIC hospital, um, you know, what, what, you know, th how did, uh, from the labor point of view, from organizing workers on the job, how did that play into, uh, also, uh, this issue of, uh, labor and, uh, um, uh, you know, black liberation and the strategic alliance? Oh, sure. So, um, so like I said, I, I, I got a clerical job. Uh, in the dean's office in the College of Medicine at UIC. Um, and I don't know, one of the first friends that I made working there was this guy, Alvin Jackson, who ran the, the copy room, um, you know, back then in the, in the days before 
everyone having a, a, their own uh, PC and, and office printer, uh, the College of Medicine had a central copy room. And that's where we, that's how we also used it as our lunchroom. So I'm sitting there one day talking to Alvin and, um, and we, you know, I, I was reading a union newsletter. I started talking about, you know, the contract and I started talking about how terrible our wages were. Um, I was making, I think, $8 an hour uh, in 1990. And, and Alvin turned to me and he said, he said, you know, they make more money than us in Urbana, which is the, the flagship campus of the University of Illinois system. And I had just moved to Chicago a few years earlier from Iowa City. And I knew that in those little towns that the cost of living is like 30% lower than it is in Chicago. And I was like, I was dumbstruck. How could they possibly justify paying the workers in Chicago 30% less? And I said this to Alvin and, you know, he's African-American and he just rolled his eyes at me. Um, so, you know, then I, uh, the next year or two years later, I got on the bargaining committee and I started to try to pose this question, you know, to the union staff and then to management. Management refused to talk about it. But in, in 1998, there was a wave of struggle that involved, you know, a black and Latino student protest movement uh, against, uh, you know, basically attacks on affirmative action. There was a, 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 a struggle by black and Latino medical students uh, against discriminatory practices there. There was a struggle going on in Pilsen where actually my, my old friend Chewy Garcia was helping to lead a movement to resist UIC's efforts to uh, privatize, uh, I mean, to uh, gentrify the neighborhood. Um, the university was also trying to get the city to get rid of all of the public housing along Roosevelt Road. Um, and, and you know, with, with our union dealing with this discriminatory pay issue, we were able to help bring together all of these different forces. And then we used our ties with the progressives, well, mainly the Latino and black members of the um, of the state legislature to come in and hold hearings uh, on the university's discriminatory practices. And we had two weekends of hearings with hundreds of people from the community and from campus. And that's actually when I met Barack Obama for the first time. He was the rookie state senator from Hyde Park. He had so much star power already that the next day after the first day of hearings, the article in the Tribune, he got the big quote. <laughs> and can you guess, can you guess what his quote was? No, go ahead. <laughs> he said, you hate to think the worst of an institution, but when you see so many examples, you have to think there's got to be a change. <laughs> anyway, but through that coalition, through that united front, we forced the university to give our members the Urbana pay scale, which represented a dollar or two dollars an hour increase. But, uh, you know, it, you know, for every worker that we had at that point, about 1300 members at UIC, there was never any talk of back pay. They built UIC in 1965. And we realized in going back through it, that for 35 years, we won this in 98 for 33 years, there was about a thousand workers, mostly black, who were being paid a dollar or two dollars an hour less than the white workers at, at the Urbana campus. Do the math. That's between a thousand and two thousand dollars a year loss in wages for a thousand workers over 35 years. I mean, it represents like 60 or 70 or 80 million dollars in lost wages. And um, and it Incredible. just and it just struck me like, and this is just one institution, but it's the you know it was the shadow of the plantation, which you know, uh, you know Martin Luther King when when he came north to Chicago in the mid '60s, he called uh, Chicago Little Mississippi, because the the legacy of racism, you know, uh, well it 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 lives to this day. It's uh, anyway so I. I, I, uh, uh, so that, that was my, uh, you know, that was my, my, my first big struggle that I was involved in, um, at UIC. 
Yeah, and, and there's a, and this this kind of thing happens all over the country. I'm sure, uh, you know, whatever whatever state you're in or whatever city you're in, uh, uh, if you check out the university there, the 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 local politicians, the national politicians, it's all it all fits together the same way there as it does in Chicago. It's yeah. just uh, an example here. Yes. Um, I mean, you went from there to become a, a you know a labor leader. You know, of you were then, I guess, but uh, I mean, a labor leader. Uh, right after the, the after that, the executive I, board. After cetera. that, I got I got invited to be on the executive board of of the <laughs> local, <clears throat> and uh, um, and then uh, you know was on the you know the bargaining committees and um, and I stayed there for you know twenty some more years and uh, and and I'm, I'm I, I thought of retiring early. But I, I decided to, to stay and get my full pension. Uh, and so I was still working there in 2020 um, when uh, two, you know, two things happened. We had a contract campaign. Um, and by this time, the union had grown to representing 4,000 workers um, at UIC. Mostly the center of it was always in the hospital. Um, and then two things happened that year. One is uh, we got a new president, Diane Palmer, uh, the, who has has uh, brought a great spirit uh, to, to our union. She really believes in our members and she showed that belief in us by leading since she became president in 2018. She has led three major strikes in the city of Chicago. First, um, uh, marching next to Stacey Davis Gates and the Chicago Teachers Union uh, striking the Chicago Public Schools in 2019, then standing together with the Illinois Nurses Association, uh, we struck the University of Illinois at Chicago in the fall of 2020. And uh, third, she struck in the summer of 2021 Cook County Hospital and Cook County corporate offices. Um, but uh, the, anyway, the third element in the strike at UIC was COVID. Um, when when uh, when COVID hit. UIC, it was uh, it was really terrible. You know, I'm an essential worker, so I was actually allowed to work, you know, three days a week from home. But I had to come back to campus two days a week, um, and uh, and and the, the university administration, their handling of COVID was just atrocious. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll you know this this story I think sums it up. Um, the university has a school of public health, a prominent school of public health. On February 27th, 2020, a, a, a prominent professor, an emeritus professor, um, Howard Ehrman, who had also, who's an, who was a PhD, but also an MD, and his PhD was in public health, and he had been under Harold Washington, the assistant head of the Department of Public Health for Cook, for Cook County. Um, and uh, he sent an email to the university administration and he CC'd this large administrative listserv that I, that I was on, um, which, you know, basically every department head, um, you know, and every dean, you know, on campus gets this email. February 27th, he sends an email and he says, he says, look, um, you know, this, the, 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 what's happened in Seattle proves that COVID-19 that that that, it, that there's community spread, and and the speed with which it's spreading, and 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 now we know that there are COVID cases in Chicago, and he said it's just you know it's happening already. It's spreading in Chicago. The university administration needs to take effective action now to protect our our students, our staff, and our patients at the hospital, and the university administration did nothing for two more weeks until J.B. Uh, Pritzker said he ordered the shutdown of the school. And in the meantime, <clears throat> COVID was ripping through our, you know, our workplace uh, and in our hospital, you know, which became a, you know, a, a place where a lot of COVID patients were coming. My coworkers uh, were told um, if you're not in a COVID ward, don't wear a mask because you're going to scare the patients. And, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. And it, and it, so that was, that was March. In May, 
a picture of our hospital was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and a week later, a picture of our hospital was on the front page of the Guardian of London as, as a poster child for how terribly some institutions, some medical institutions in the U.S. were dealing with COVID. And as a result of their failures, um, three of my friends died of COVID, including Juan Martinez, who was a surgical tech and a leader in the union. Um, the hospital had five deaths by the middle of May. Um, you know, two members of Local 73, two members of the Nurses Association and the, the husband of one of the nurses who got COVID there, took it home to her husband, she, you know, and oh, by the way, they were all black, Latino or Filipino um, or Filipina. Uh, no, he was, there was one man, Filipino. Um, and, uh, and we're negotiating a contract in the middle of this and management takes a hard line towards, you know, holding us on, on wages and working conditions. And they just inflamed um, our members. And so September, uh, uh, September 12th, uh, 5,000 of us went out on strike and we shut the place down for, uh, for 12 days um, and, uh, and forced management to put a lot more money on the table to settle that strike than they had put on the table the day before we went out on strike. But the, the mood, the explosive feeling in all of those picket lines and mass marches, it was, it felt just like the marches that happened in the days after the murder of George Floyd. It was the same. I mean, it was, I mean, our, our strike was 95% black, Latino and Filipino. Um, it was because a lot of the nurses are Filipino. So anyway, so yeah, that was, uh, I, it's, it's, it was, it was horrible. It's terrible. It was horrible to go through it, but at least, you know, as a result of the, of the, of the deaths and the trauma that the employer contributed to us going through, we were able to get a modicum of justice by, by forcing them to treat the rest of us, the remaining workers, the people who survived, um, to treat us with a measure of, of, of respect. Well, uh, we're, we're almost out of time. And, uh, well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I can talk forever, as you know, Richard. <laughs> um, what we I'm, need is a cigar. Uh, you see, uh, if no, we had a cigar. <laughs> I'm not going to say any of that. Um, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's been a joy having you here. I know we can talk forever. And, uh, um, you know, my hat's off to you. you. Your whole life, you've been a person who points out, um, you know, the truth to people, the the issues of how uh, you know exploitation and how the rich and the greedy uh, and the powerful uh, you know keep us down and, and and what the roadmap is to for for freedom to fight for our for justice and uh, the tragedies that we talked about here uh, whether it's you know the equal pay for equal work at UIC or the uh, the tragedy of COVID at your with your co-workers at the UIC hospital or or, or uh, Tyree Nichols, uh, which is happening in, in Memphis and, and is happening repeatedly over and over again across the country. Um, you've been an example, uh, you know, for working class people of how to stand up and fight back. And my hat's off to you for that. Um, as we wind down here, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, to our Fight Back Radio listeners? I think I did my I think I did my 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 plugs already, but I'll just reiterate them. February twenty eighth. If you're in Chicago, um, you got to come out and vote for these historic district council elections. If you don't know who your council candidates are, um, you can go to the Chicago Alliance website c a a r p r dot o r g, and there's a list of all the candidates. You can also go to the Reader, the Chicago Reader, which has a, 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 a you know, if if because we don't we don't endorse candidates, the Alliance doesn't endorse candidates, but the Reader does, and the Reader has like went through and like it, most helpfully it identified which of them are cops, because um, there are some cops running for these seats, uh, people who are you know retirees or cops in other cities or pro cop, um, and um, so no, so number one, vote on uh, on February twenty eighth. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, and number two, um, if you're, uh, trying to figure out how to contribute to the struggle, um, join Freedom Road. Uh, you can go to our website, frso.org. 
you can click the the button that says join um, and uh, uh, and you know and get involved in uh, working class struggle, get involved in national liberation struggles in whatever town you're in, but we can help guide you. Sounds good. And subscribe to Fight Back Radio. <laughs> okay, no problem. See you all later. There you go. That was Joe Osbaker and uh, um, an old friend of mine, as I said, and uh, talking about some serious stuff. And uh, I think, uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, and I hope, uh, you know, like I said, uh, as we came in, uh, you know, give us a positive review, write something down, give us five stars, tweet it out to a friend, uh, do all those things. That's helpful to us. If you want to reach us here at Fight Back Radio, you can reach us at uh, richard.fightbackradio at gmail.com. That's richard.fightbackradio at gmail.com. And, uh, and also you can find us on, uh, you know, Twitter and Instagram and, uh, um, you know, Facebook, all those other things too, and let people know about it. You know, it's like the way we, you know, the word gets out is from you. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully you enjoy uh, Fight Back Radio. If you have ideas uh, about how we can improve it, like I said, uh, send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and uh, I also want to, you know, I do this every week, but it's, it's you know, for real. The, the, the production team we got here is uh, fabulous. These are all people that are volunteers and do stuff uh, uh, you know on their own time and it's it's a lot of work to edit these things down and uh, especially with a, a guy like me who does technical things that are wrong all the time so uh, um, you know really a shout out to uh, Dodd McColgan, uh, Vince Olson and Shane Tremley and uh, for the entire Fight Back Radio team I'm Richard Berg saying until next time all power to the people. <laughs>